we're creating about as many jobs as those other metros combined. So Ben hates to be compared to Boulder. We could have a whole hour conversation about this. I think it sets us up another kind of foundation. Participating. Okay. I think that's the difference between being a citizen or sitting on the sidelines. These conversations are brought to you by the Lad Group, Ben's leading real estate team. Help continue this Ben B conversation by subscribing, sharing, and leaving us a review. So we've got uh, Damon Runberg. You're the chief economist for Business Oregon uh, here with us today. Yeah, Gee, Business Oregon, which, you know, it's a vague enough name that I feel like people are kind of like, yeah, 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 that thing. Uh, Tell me, what is Business yeah, Oregon? State's Economic Development Agency. Okay. Um, uh, uh, it's actually the Oregon Business and uh, Development uh, Department. So OBDD is the technical term, but everyone realized that was too much of a mouthful. And so Business Oregon is how we're fondly known around the state. Okay, well, I can get my head around that. So you and I have got to know each other over the last couple of years. Um, we've shared stages for economic forecasts, for real estate, for EDCO. Um, and then more recently, we've been working together on Ben 101. And I've gotten to know you a little bit better and really enjoyed your you know, fresh perspective on, and not just fresh perspective, interpretation and how to deliver what's happening economically. And I thought it would be a really productive conversation today. Yeah, I love talking economics. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> uh, and, and you always do it with a bit of humor. So, you know, you're, you're very um, comfortable in this economic field and able to deliver it in a, in a humorous manner, usually with a chuckle. Um, where did your, your comfort of performance come from? Have you always been comfortable on stage? Um, actually, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think um, from a, a pretty young age, like I was like, you know, talking like middle school, you know, you start, start doing your first like sort of class presentations yeah. or whatever like that that was like my favorite part of school were those moments which i know that people say like well that's you know the most terrifying moments in school are when yeah. they give a, a class talk um i also loved making sort of comparisons about like whatever it was that i was presenting on for the whatever class project yeah. you know you name it um and making sort of uh, an analogy to some other components so that we could sort of envision that thing differently uh, sort of frame it in a different way so that maybe we'd understand it better. And I mean, from like a young age, I was doing that. And I had no idea that someday in my professional life, that would actually be like something I'd be doing. It synthesized and, and came to fruition. That's great. Yeah, I was the polar opposite. I was the kid in the back of the room, hands shaking, not wanting to speak in front of the 20 people I've known for 10 years. <laughs> so uh, here we are. Well, uh, you're, you're, that's that's pretty common. I think you know whatever stats someone they say about public speaking being the things people are most terrified about. By the way, I, I'm wherever that stat comes from, I have no idea. And I always question when we all have stats that we're like, yeah, that's the thing that yeah. we that we all know is that it's like the most we're more terrified of that than death or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, probably not true, but uh, it is a, a general stereotype. Well, you you can't, you don't have a footnote to cite for that. <laughs> no, but um, before we talk about economics, and I think you're going to add an interesting perspective on where we stand both as a city and a state. Um, let's a little bit. Of, let's go into a little bit of your origin story. Why are you here in Central Oregon and what brought you here? Yeah, yeah, it's actually kind of an interesting story. I'd say my origin to Bend was probably like everyone else's at some point, uh, which was uh, my wife and I were like, you know, we were a young married couple. We had uh, I, at the time, I was working for Oregon State University as a researcher. Okay. Um, she was just finished nursing school and was at uh, OHSU and had this sort of flexibility to do her practicum um, uh, at any hospital. It just had to be in Oregon. And so I was working uh, in, the, in Oregon State said, you know, you could work wherever you want in the state. It has to be in Oregon. She could do her practicum in any hospital in the state. Like, where, where, if we could live anywhere for a year, yeah. where would we live? And so it was 2010, and we said, well, let's go, let's go live in Bend for a year. What, yeah. a, what a fun thing to do as a young married couple. Um, and our one year has now turned into 14, I guess. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, you and I landed in Bend the same year. Oh, okay. 2010. Nice. And uh, very different landscape. Uh, yeah. Very different energy, very different heartbeat to what was happening. Yeah, you know, it's I mean, not to jump too much in the economics too quickly, but... Um, I have a lot of friends, it makes sense. We, a lot of my, our community sort of was built of folks who moved around the same period of time. Yeah. And I hear a lot of sort of complaints or, or frustrations with Ben's growth or activity, or it's hard yeah. to get into a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. You need to always get a reservation or whatever it might be. 
And I'm, I sort of have to remind them that like, you know, you, you, when you say back when I moved here, it was like X, Y, or Z. Yeah. That back when we moved here, Ben was in like one of the most devastating recessions that the city had ever seen. Yeah. And, um, you know, restaurants weren't full because people were unemployed. Like it yeah. was, it was a dire economic time. And so sometimes we have to dis- we have to sort of separate this concept of like growth, um, number of people and, and sort of economic conditions. And I think so much we're so sort of framed by the old bend is framed by the recessionary characteristics and yeah. not so much this growth trajectory. Yeah, I was reading some psychology on that recently where we uh, humans have a tendency to uh, glorify and gloss over the tough parts of our past and, and interpreted it all as great, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and and we forget the pain that's associated with empty restaurants yeah. and the good old days, the good concept. old days, yeah, yeah, the good old days concept. So, um, yeah, I mean, even just the numbers wise, 2010, I, I believe that was about 75,000 people. Yeah, we're at what 106 yeah. and counting. Yeah, a couple of years ago we broke over the 100. So, yeah, I mean, a significant amount of growth in a short period of time for yeah. sure. And we're just one small chapter of of Ben's history. But um, you know, I th- I, I think th- I was going to get to that later. But let's talk about that a little bit because there's a lot of people that are, yeah. and I dare say newer to Ben that that gloss over and say Ben, it it just all needs to stop. <laughs> and you know, let's dive in from an economic perspective. What does making it all stop mean economically and and what are there and are there comparables that we can visualize like you were talking about before looking at it and kind of helping people visualize so what does it look like to have a town that isn't bent yeah that that, that growth is not in the BN, the dna or had a, a moment in time where they had growth but then it stopped to change the industry whatnot um what does that look like and feel like economically yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, oftentimes people think when economists talk um, and we talk about economic growth that we think sort of everything is um, all about growth. That's, yes, that's all it is. Like it's it's growth for growth's sake. Yeah. And um, that's all we focus on. And that, um, you know, it, from an environmental perspective, uh, it, we create a lot of enemies yeah. based on that stereotype. Yeah. Uh, because they think it's like, well, we're, we can sort of you know, rape and pillage the planet yep. um, until there's nothing left, but this is for the sake of economic growth, and that's the ultimate goal. And that's yeah. actually not how we economists think. That's that's sort of the stigma and the stereotype. But but growth is a reflection of us. So as a community is growing for a variety of reasons, we see economic changes that occur. So um, if there is uh, a certain industry cluster that is thriving in your community, that means that that business is hiring workers. They need to expand. Yeah. And so uh, those create opportunities for labor and jobs, and that creates a flow of people in. Um, that's one sort of form of growth, and that is simply growth to meet a need, not growth for growth's sake. That's yeah. saying, you know, there are jobs here, uh, and those jobs are being created to meet an economic need, which is for whatever widget is being produced or yeah. service is being yeah. rendered. Um, and in Ben's case, you have sort of this interesting mix where we have growth for uh, one big reason, which is sort of the second paycheck concept, the quality of life reasons of Ben. Um, second paycheck is a concept that um, my mentor, Ed Whitelaw, sort of coined back in the early 80s. Uh, and it's this idea of like, we all get our first paycheck. So like, you know, what your day job is. Yep. Um, but every place you live, you have lived in your life, there's some value to the place that you live that that gives you some some benefit back. Yeah. Um, whether that's like okay. your community, like you could think of, you know, like uh, your family has, your children have good schools or friends. That's yep. the second paycheck. There's a value to you. Uh, he framed it in the concept of ecosystem services. So uh, he was focused living in the, the day and age where we were seeing, you know, mass, uh, you know, uh, clear cuts in the forest or whatnot and said, you know, what is the value of clean water and air in you, to you in this community? If you live someplace that's poison water like Flint, Michigan, that's a negative second paycheck. You got to pay me extra yeah. to live someplace with poison water, right? Well, Bend has a really high second paycheck for a lot of people, not everybody, mm-hmm. but if you value, value recreation, sunshine, open space, um, public lands, these are huge second paycheck things. And so people move towards those second paychecks, uh, in fact, are willing to forego the, the first paycheck. The first pay, yeah, they're willing to go a little bit lower, you know, yeah. to say like, I'm gonna sacrifice some career opportunities. 
because that second paycheck boosts it up so that it's it's higher than or equal to what it would have been elsewhere. So Ben has these quality of life folks that move here for that second paycheck. Yeah. We have retirees that move here. These are growth components, but we have that economic activity of businesses that are concentrated here that have been doing well and mm -hmm. then are also creating jobs. And then more people creates more demand, especially for sort of local goods and services. Mm -hmm. So um, you sort of have this rolling stone situation where it can't grow any moss because as we grow, the growth sort of creates more growth. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? And as more people means more demand, more demand creates need for more jobs, which attracts more people. Yeah. Um, so for a variety of reasons why someone might show up um, in this growth scenario. Yeah, well, I've, a couple interesting terms in there. I've never heard of second paycheck, um, and it, it makes sense. Um, it, let's talk about that. Are you know is is are we still growing? And and the reason I ask that is you know maybe it's it's a personal um, belief unfounded. And I don't have enough things to footnote as far as the data, but it feels very different. Let's say the last 12, 18 months, and I understand that we had to come off of the pandemic wave of migration and and um, you know, the economic disruptions and, and inflation, and there was all kinds of stuff going on. It was kind of hard to, to really understand what's going on. But now that we're, you know, enough post pandemic, um, the economic footprint or the, the state of our economics feels different. It feels to me like in migration is at a trickle. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels like new business growth is slow. Is that is that founded in data? Uh, I love people with gut feelings because um, most people's guts uh, are have a semblance of reality to them. I mean, yeah. like uh, the sort of the economic joke is that you know the the plural of anecdote does not equal data. Um, like plural you, of anecdote does not equal data. Okay, got like, it. Like yeah, you, yeah. you and your friend collectively chatting yeah. about saying saying your feelings about stuff doesn't isn't a data point. Yep. Now that saying or that quote is actually a little bit wrong. That like actually. If you put enough of our anecdotes together, then it really is data. And so um, your your feeling there is is rooted in reality. Like we are we are seeing um, this perception has happened, you know, especially over the last five years that Ben blew up during the pandemic, blew up from a growth perspective. Uh, the reality is that even in the strongest pandemic wave year, our growth rate wasn't really much different than what it was before the pandemic. So we sort of had a continuation of the trend that we were seeing before, okay. which was strong growth uh, in a very good economic time. We had come out of the longest expansion in Ben's history, yeah. you know, longest in U.S. history before the pandemic. Um, but really, you know, so so we never really had a big wave from the pandemic. Of and, in migration. Of in migration. Okay. Um, it was strong numbers, but once yeah. again, similar to what we we're seeing before. Okay. Um, the last few years, though, we have seen some of the slowest rates of growth, really the slowest rates since 2011, 12, 10, 11, 12, when we were in the midst of the Great Recession, where there were no job opportunities. And then you'd have to go back all the way to the 1980s since we saw growth rates as slow in a, in a previous era. And you're saying, what is that, the last 12 months? Or? Oh, no, last two years. Really. Last two years. Yeah, so 20, slowest 2022 growth. and 2023. And define growth. How are you defining Yeah, population growth. growth. Population growth. Yeah, and that's all total population. That includes everybody, not just job numbers or the working age population or whatever. And, and we sort of are, we, we dropped under 1% last year growth, which um, it's important to put this into context. Um, many communities in Oregon would love to have an annual 1% growth rate. Yeah, uh, or or just under one percent. So population-wise, one percent growth rate is is fairly is significant for for most places. Yeah, for most for places. us, that's a trickle. That's a trickle, uh, and that's what you're feeling is that is that a distinct slowdown there, and so you know it it begs the question a little bit of uh, of why you know why would we be seeing slowing growth in a time where Ben still seems to be doing well? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people have um, the belief that people are pouring in here, and and that's causing massive housing shortage, housage, housing shortages. Um, you're saying that's not necessarily the case. We're, we're slowing down on in-migration. Um, if that's the case, um, let's talk about quality of life. Um, and, and the biggest thing in my world, because I'm myopically focused on real estate, is housing prices. Yeah. Um, what are the biggest factors you see play into housing prices? Because a lot of people see cranes in the air in the old mill. They see a few neighborhoods going up, you know, here in the west side in Discovery West or 
or southeast or northeast bend and they're saying there's construction everywhere and it's st housing prices are still going up let's look at it from an economic point of view what's happening with housing yeah so housing's tricky so we we have had this period of rapid growth and yes it's been slower the last few years yep um we have generally had a history of underbuilding yes we have have been building and we see those construction materials and those yeah cranes and, and whatever sort of these these larger developments going up and so the perception is like they're building everywhere they're paving paradise to put yeah. up a parking lot you know okay yeah, yeah. so like that's what people think um but relative to the pace of growth we've seen we have sort of an entrenched deficit of building that we've done specifically for housing yeah um commercials doing generally fine yeah the pandemic shifted some of the the demand for commercial space yeah a lot more lease signs up in commercial. Right yes, now. exactly. But it didn't necessarily change the dynamic as much on the housing front, although maybe it did in some ways because it created more work from home scenarios, yeah. which then people were looking for a different type of housing. Yeah. Um, but but so we had sort of this history, this decade or more of underbuilding uh -huh. because we had this great recession that happens. And I don't always, I, I hate sort of harping back to the great recession, Yeah. but it was such a sort of a sort of a, a moment of, transformation and bend where um it was a devastating recession uh you know the home prices tanked by over 50 percent yep. it was it was really bad and that was in part largely due to super high unemployment I mean, yep. a lot of folks lost jobs real economic pain yeah um this idea so when you hear the 50 percent drop in home prices a lot of people are like oh man can we do that again yeah, yeah absolutely if, if only and then i'm like yeah but we did that through like a catastrophe yeah uh, and it tore apart our economy. Yeah, it was it was really devastating. And and yet you sort of say like, well, you know, we had this glut of housing on the market then because of all these distressed homes, this yep. foreclosures, short sales, et cetera, tank the prices. How did we get to a point where we had a deficit of housing? And is it fair to say that we're short about 5,000 homes in Bend? I mean, it, it, what's the framework in, in, by which you judge it? But you know, when I did some back of the napkin calculations, I was saying, could we have enough houses to meet median workforce income, you know, to match media, you know, to, to so that median workforce could afford a house? It was a, it was a monstrosity of houses that needed. And, and I was saying we're short about 5,000 homes. And it, it kind of matched up with that. We were under supplying about 1,000 to 1,500 homes a year from the start of the Great Recession up through about, what, 15, 16? Yeah, is that yeah. The specific number, I don't have this on my head, um, and it's something that the state's working on. It's state's mandating that cities uh, evaluate and plan for uh, identifying this, this particular deficit that exists today, and then how do they plan to build to meet that deficit, yeah. address that in the future. And it's also important to note that we're talking about housing. It's not just homes, single family yes. homes. Yep. Housing units would include uh, multifamily apartments, condos, duplexes, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, huge deficit there for sure, whatever that number might be. But, uh, you know, we could blame local leaders to some extent, and we could blame the state policy to mm -hmm. another, and we could blame the fact that we were in this recession comatose. Um, if you put all that together, um, in, in Oregon, we have this state land use law, these zoning laws that are very specific. Many people have heard the concept of an urban growth boundary. Um, it's a beautiful concept. Yep. I think most people who hear this concept would be like, yes, I'm all about it. And it's this idea of saying, we can't just go sprawl endlessly in, yeah. into our forests and our farmlands. Um, in Oregon, we have boundaries. So this is the city limits. This is our urban growth boundary. And if we want to grow beyond that, we need to justify that we need that land for that growth. And once again, if you go to other places around the United States that have insane urban sprawl, most of us look at that pretty negatively. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't know if you drive to Boise today and you go on some of the back roads, if you're on like Highway 20, for instance, and you kind of driving towards Boise and you're like, hey, I must be getting there. I'm, I'm here. And then because you're driving through a neighborhood and then you pop through the back end of that neighborhood and you're like, wait, it's just farmland still. And yeah. you realize there's yeah. this sub, you know, this development in the middle of nowhere yeah. because they could. And that has quality of life implications to it. Um, and and it also sort of affects economic opportunities that exist on those lands for, for agriculture or forest land or recreation yeah. in our case in many ways. So it's a good concept. Yeah. Um, the problem is it's not particularly nimble. And yeah. so in a fast growing community like Bend, um, we need some opportunities to grow that quicker than the state allows. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the state's working on that. I wanna give them credit for that. 
our local leader's fault is that in the midst of the recession, when home prices had tanked and the supply of housing was abundant, they said it was they were due for doing an urban growth boundary expansion, but they put it on hold and started to delay that process because they said we don't need to. Things are yeah. things are um, hunky dory, not hunky dory. Things are pretty bad, yeah. which means we don't need to expand. Yeah, um, and we can hold off on that. Well, the problem was, and it's hard to know this, and you know, this hindsight's twenty twenty, mm-hmm. so I don't mean too critical, but they sh- they needed to keep pushing forward with that urban growth boundary expansion because it was like a light switch that Ben turned back on. Yeah, we went from flat employment for like three years into just the rocket ship took off yeah. and it was too little too late. And so you put those two together of sort of that sort of malaise around the recession and not responding to expand our boundary. Then it meant that when we started building houses again, uh, we were in a land strap position. We couldn't do it. And it just became really expensive and hard to, you know, we didn't have sort of the, you know, it's a whole different conversation about labor and workforce and businesses that yeah. have houses. Yeah. But, but we did have a lot of those folks, and for them to meet this need was never going to happen. Brian Ladd here. I hope you're enjoying the conversation and find this dialogue relevant to really what it means to live and work and play in this amazing community. As Ben's leading real estate team, we take our role seriously in representing both buyers and sellers at the absolute highest standards of our industry. For more information on how we can help, feel free to visit our website at benpropertysource.com or text LAD1, L-A-D-D-1, to 88000. The composition of housing coming on right now um, is is probably a little bit more skewed towards single family housing, which is not attainable for all. And the first couple tiers of the ladder that that historically have existed have been um, condos, townhomes, things like that. Um, we're, you know, I know the city has a big initiative on that. The one thing that I, that's particularly concerning to me is the condos. Um, economically, um, and there's other reasons such as construction defect lawsuits and whatnot on on condos as opposed to apartments, but most of the multifamilies that I'm seeing come on are as rent. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a particular concern for me because when, when long-term people- Long-term rentals or short-term? Long-term rentals. And when I see, you know, when I, when I see the majority of all the multifamily, multi-level buildings that are going up are coming on as rentals, it seems like we're gonna be able to saturate that and bring down rental costs which is great. But what I don't see is an upward train, you know, chain for people to, to stay in and move from a condo to a townhome to a single Get your family. foot in the door. As yeah, buyer. you get your foot in the door as buyer and that first threshold is so high. I guess I'm, I'm really concerned with that on how it affects the, the viability of our town long-term for teachers, so, you know, social workers, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think one thing that Ben did for many years was we did underbuild the multifamily. Yeah. We basically created like a single family city. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, at, at some point, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm an economist. So what the market demands, um, the market provides, yeah. uh, the market demanded single family houses. Yeah. Um, now at the time, yeah, that was true. And, and most people would say if they could choose a, housing type, they would pick a single family house. Yeah. Not everyone's in the economic position to afford such a thing. Yep. And so um, we sort of shot ourselves in the foot from that perspective is that mm-hmm. like the market only built these things for a long time in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, yeah. only we're building single family homes. Um, we've done a really good job doing the multifamily. Yeah. And I think almost every economist would, if would ask the question, what's the best way to address our housing shortage? You know, what do we, what do we, what should we build yeah. more of? The answer is, all of everything, yeah. literally everything across the yeah. spectrum. More of the McMansions, yes, um, because someone moving from their, uh, well, I don't know what you call it, below a McMansion, but you know, yeah. the next tiered below is moving into that, which then creates a vacancy in the house that they were in that someone comes in. It creates a chain reaction yeah. that like, if you are not building all across the spectrum, then uh, be bottlenecks. there's bottlenecks that occur and then you're going to have like real price wars over these bottleneck places. Yep. And you also have sort of aging housing stock. And so when, when housing ages, theoretically it becomes more affordable. A 1980s house and bend is going to be cheaper than a 2023 house. Yep. Kind of like your car, but not quite as extreme. Yep. Uh, your car depreciates, your house will still appreciate, but just not at the same value as, as, as a new construction. Yeah. And so, 
like that's important too is that you know as someone moves from their older home into a newer home once again it creates an opportunity for someone from below and so i think i think the concern about like you know rental versus ownership opportunities um i i would be less concerned about that as long as we're building all of the things yeah and assuming that like you know a certain share of those that are going if a higher share are going to the rental market yep. then that probably says that there's a higher demand there for that. That's the highest and best use for that. Okay. That's where the money is going to flow. Um, so I would trust that over the long run that like we'll find some equilibrium on the those. The nice thing is on a flip of a switch, you could switch that from a rental to um, a for sale property. The person who owns that could sell it um, and decide not to. Depending on product rental. type, yeah. whether it's, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that opportunity is a lot uh, more nimble yeah. than to say we should build more housing. Uh, it takes a long time to build that condo complex, but to turn that condo unit from a, a you know an, a, a, a rental to an owner uh, much quicker. Um, and so it's just great to see that we are building sort of all the things. Yeah. Um, we had a, a wave of multifamily. The wave of multifamily has slowed down, but what we are seeing now on the multifamily side is actually pretty high in multifamily, really nice apartments and very desirable parts of Bend. Um, which often get criticized a little bit too, but once again, it's sort of the all of everything yeah. uh, is really important. And not everybody is looking for a single family house. Some people are looking for like a nice, you know, suite yep. that has a beautiful view of the river or the mountains or whatever. And, and maybe that's not for you, but like there's a market for that and building all the things will eventually take the price pressure across the board off a little bit. Yeah, because it's, it's liquid within that. Okay, so I, I get that. So now let's talk, about, because a lot of people see economists as fortune tellers. <laughs> You've yeah. got your globe. Yeah. And I saw a joke when I was researching before we came in. It said economists have predicted nine of the last five recessions. <laughs> um, so, so put on your fortune teller hat. Um, where do we stand now and, and what do you see in, in Ben's future in the next couple of years? Yeah, well, um, there are, are two types of economists. There are those that predict the future and those that know that the future is uncertain. I'm one of those, um, This the future is uncertain. So I, I don't wanna say this is a forecast, but- I, With I, the big disclaimer, yeah, asterisk. Yeah, um, I'm i am I'm definitely someone who, um, right. uh, I'm, I'm bullish on Ben. I'm off, uh, encouraged and optimistic about Ben. There are, uh, Oregon has generally had a pretty big, has a, has a major issue. This is statewide, not, yeah. not Ben specific. Um, we, we're seeing we saw net out migration for two years, two years running, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, our bread and butter in the state of Oregon has been basically since the time of Lewis and Clark. And even before that, when our First Nations people were here, people have always been moving to Oregon. And yeah. that has been able to uh, create a, a robust workforce, created more employment opportunities. Uh, businesses knew that the workers were here. It was yeah. this sort of so, you know, sort of like that rolling ball we started with, yeah. where it's like it's once the ball is rolling down the hill, you know, moss doesn't grow on it. Yeah, um, that was Oregon for a long time, uh, and the issue is we've seen that in migration stall. Yeah, why is it stalled? Lots of, lots of sort of opinions about why it's stalled. Some of it are uh, political ideology. Yeah. you know, I moved to Idaho because Oregon's too liberal. And yeah, Idaho's the right conservative nature of, for me. Um, some people might have moved for that. Yeah. It takes a lot to get someone to move, yeah. uh, pick up their life and their job and their family and move someplace else. Political ideology um, may be true. For most people, that's a, that's a, you'd have to be really politically opinionated to move for those reasons. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, my, my reason why I think Oregon has seen slower in migration is the housing price issue that we've seen across the state. Yeah. And, and this is jeopardizing Oregon's economic future. Mm -hmm. It's a major concern that I have. And so when looking at Ben, Ben is sort of a microcosm of this. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe not a microcosm, maybe like a great example of this, which is we are very expensive on housing because we don't have a lot of supply of it. The availability is tight. Um, and so it's stalling, it's slowing our in-migration. So, yeah, we're not seeing negative out-migration yet. Um, but our fast growth went down to modest growth. Yeah. Uh, and so if I had a concern for Ben, it was like, um, are we going to sort of follow the same pattern where we become so inexpensive that sure, people still want to live here, um, but they can't afford it. And, yeah. so they, and so they don't move here, which then stalls out all the other economic growth that was happening. 
Yeah. And once again, you got the quality of life reasons where someone's here, but then you also have the economic reasons why someone would move here. Yeah. And if the quality of life people can't afford to move here, then that creates a labor force shortage. And if that happens, then the economic reason someone might move here, there's less, you know, they don't need, they're not hiring as much anymore. Yeah. There's not that growth. Then you're not getting the in migration from the folks moving for jobs. Yeah. It can really stall things out quickly. So that's like the, the worst case scenario. But what Bend in Central Oregon has going for it is the lifestyle stuff. Yeah. It's the quality of life. That's never going away. Yep. Um, and that that's a huge sort of feather in our hat, if you will, that I think I'm pretty encouraged by. But the next, you know, five years will probably be one of pretty modest growth. Yeah. Um, and our whole perception, we, you know, this is going to feel maybe like a period of like, oh my goodness, what happened? Bend is like dying or whatever. It just, it's going to be slow growth. And yeah. for us, after a period of rapid growth, slow growth is going to feel different. You alluded to it, actually, when you sort of said, you know, the last year, 12 months yeah. feels different. You know, it'll probably be like that for the next five years. Yeah, it, it, it's a, the, the pulse is is very different. And for those that are saying, hey, Bend is, is a runaway train and it's and it's blowing up, um, I, I would encourage you to, 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 you know, participate because it feels very different. Um, and I, like you, am... And bullish on Bend um, in long term. It's like the way Warren Buffett feels about the U.S. stock market. You know, he's like, "Hey, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen the next year or two, but I believe in America and I believe in in the long term viability of Bend." But um, like you, I have worries about some of the factors. And when I talk to business leaders, they have the same concerns that you just addressed. They said, "I would love to grow, but I can't find employees because I can't pay them enough to afford to live here." Um, you know, and and it takes two working. You know, in a couple, it takes both of them working to afford childcare, and childcare is expensive. And and it's we're in a we're in a in a time where there's a lot of headwinds to growth and change. So I think it's it's going to be a lot more modest. Yeah. Um, but I think it gives Ben the time to reflect, take a breath, and hopefully we can, um, you know, use this as a time to s see where we want to go. I know there's a lot of good groups working on that. I know that. Um, Envision Bend is now. What's the name of their their group now? I think that's what it is. Or it's Envision it, Bend yeah, now. It used, to it be, used to be Ben twenty yeah, yeah. twenty thirty, right? Yeah, but then they realized that's too soon. We gotta <laughs> we can't put a date on it. Ben twenty thirty came, but there's yeah. Envision Bend, and then I know the city's doing a lot of great planning as well. And then let's put a bow on this economically. If you can envision a graph, I did. I see balance coming in our future with housing with demographic waves. We're in our peak earning years, peak house buying year, maybe not peak earning years, peak house buying years of our millennials right now, and the baby boomers are still holding on to their housing stock. Do you see some balance coming in housing in the next five or 10 years? Yeah, so um, this is an area that um, sometimes I, I perceived as the bad guy. I, I generally, uh, you know, maybe I frame even neg negative economic data um, with, a, with a smile and yeah. people think that, like they feel good about themselves after they walk out. They're like, man, that, I feel good about the economy. And then I'm like, Sorry, actually, that was negative news, but you just saw my smile and you thought oh. I was. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of those times where um, it's important for us to think about sort of the, the demographics and how those overlay with housing yeah. and, and the long term trend. So you, you hit the nail on the head a little bit there. Uh, so we have a huge baby boomer cohort still living in single family homes and big they, single family, homes. big, big single family homes. Oops, many of them have multiple homes. Yeah. Right? They're holding on to those. Uh, they won't hold on to those forever, Yeah. period. Um, whether through downsizing um, or through um, aging out. Yep. Uh, that's what we call death in the business. Uh, economists are really good at trying not to be morbid, but yeah. you know, uh, eventually this demographic group uh, has this glut of housing that they're holding on to that will go away yep. to somebody else yeah. because they will sell it or they'll be willed to someone. Uh, millennials are past peak buying years okay. already and millennials are the next biggest demographic that's out there so then you have to start looking down the demographic chain and say like who's coming in the pipeline as future buyers yeah uh every demographic after millennials is smaller and smaller and smaller so if we have a housing supply constraint today but we think about a future where a huge chunk of housing becomes available in 10 years as, as boomers age out of that workforce. Millennials aren't buying it any longer. Um, or the millennials are going into that next level of housing and leaving behind a thing. And all these smaller demographics behind, um, I see a future in the next 10, 15 years where home prices like 
dramatically tank. Uh, dramatically tank. Uh, an oversupply. I mean, the only scenario you could, you know, explain where it wouldn't go down uh, significantly is um, because, uh, you know, we were, uh, that aging stock sort of ages out completely, aging yeah. stock of housing. Yeah. Um, but one word of advice I would give to millennials, our parents' generation uh, treated their housing units like a investment for retirement. Yeah. And that's going to work for them, for boomers. Uh, do not do that if you're a millennial. Do not rely on your, your house as a retirement strategy because- As a retirement vehicle. Yeah. yeah. There is a good chance that your house in 2035 is, is worth less than it was in 2028, um, or 2027, whatever. It, it is entirely possible. And I'm not saying it's a certain thing, but as far as I would not make long-term financial decisions around that being my- Based my, on extrapolating value. Yeah. And to say like, well, I'll just, I'll sell my house and downsize and I'll be my retirement plan. Like yeah. don't, don't let that be your retirement plan because that is not something I would bank on right now. Yeah, so that's a pretty strong prediction, uh, but I, I, I under, but I agree on a lot of the sentiment that we're that we're going to have a peak demographic giving up housing, and once the millennials pass, you're right, each subsequent generation is smaller. But what I've noticed is after that millennial generation, even though they're smaller, we have kind of a bigger base that stays consistent rather than the big dips between generations yeah, previously. X, X was small. Um, yeah, it was boomers, and then Gen X was small, and then millennials were big. Because the millennials were the boomer, the boomers boom. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then so, but the thing is, millennials aren't booming. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, perhaps. I don't know, but uh, I don't know if we want to get into fertility yeah, yeah. rates in this conversation. But No, no, I'm just <laughs> I, I, I'm just envisioning me. I'm, I'm starting to feel like that old person saying, get to work. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I, I think we, I see some softening. I'm probably not quite as pessimistic, but like you, I'm, I'm also believe that a single family house, your primary residence is your security. It's a foundation, but it's not a, a speculative investment. Yeah. And yeah. I buy your home because it's your home. Yeah. You love it. Yeah. Uh, not because you think that it's going to be like a 100% return on investment like five years later or whatever. Yeah, and I, but I still do see a housing supply issue and constraint and high prices for the foreseeable future. I think the demographic trends that I've been studying are more in the mid-2030s when housing stock really starts to change in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and, and the, the, the key there is that like it's probably about as bad as it will ever get right now. Which I don't know if that makes us feel better or worse. I don't know, but uh, just knowing that, like the boomers, where the boomers are at and where millennials are at, it's it's it just could it's a double peak. It's a double peak right at this very moment of demanding housing or buying housing for millennials and and boomers holding on to it. So um, for those, you know, that this doesn't maybe feel good for someone who wants to buy a house tomorrow. Yeah. Um, uh, and to hear this is about as bad as it's got to get because it's it might be in this sort of tight situation for a number of years. Yeah, uh, it's there's no like easy solution except for once again, keep building more housing. Yeah, that's that's sort of the key in the short term is like we just got it. We can't stop. And and I think that we need to learn from our lessons from the Great Recession. It would be easy if we start looking at slower growth rates in Bend and say like let's pump the brakes on the building. Yeah, uh, we're growing slower. But that would be sort of ignorant to the, the point that like we are growing slower because we are in a housing constraint and yeah. housing is prices. Yeah. Our, it, housing prices are so high. So like because population growth is slowing, we need to build more. It's like those two are very connected yeah. um, and it's and it's happening. The slower growth is happening because of the housing conundrum. Um, we can't say well, let's build less because of the slower population growth. That, that's like a feedback circle that would be very negative for our community. Well, we're successfully down the rabbit hole of hypotheticals with an economist. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming in today and I uh, look forward to putting this conversation out there and, and keeping the thought uh, processing going on in, in, in Ben. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, let's do it again sometime. We have, I'm sure, a, a multitude of things we could talk about in the future. So. Absolutely. Thanks again. Right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it.